I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back along to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast as ever. I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and I'm delighted to say that on today's show, I'm joined by a very, very special guest. He's Arsenal royalty. Uh, he's one of the best in the business. I'm delighted to say that joining me today is Charles Watts, the Arsenal correspondent for Goal. Uh, Charles, how are you, my friend? Welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be here, Harry. Thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. Not quite sure it's uh, <laughs> entirely true, but thank you very much no, for that. It, it absolutely is, mate. It absolutely is. One of my go-tos in terms of uh, written content. Your YouTube channel's fantastic as well. Uh, we'll tag the YouTube channel below. So if you do uh, want to check out Charles's channel, make sure you go over there, give it a subscribe as well. And if you're listening to us, via the audio platforms well then jump on youtube and subscribe as well um and of course give him a follow on twitter all of the details are in the description um charles let's start off with this title race thing because um i have to say and i have been saying pretty much all season i was not emotionally prepared for this when we set out in august uh to kind of have to go through these emotions the stress of it all how are you kind of feeling sort of covering the club in the way that you do but also having that affection for the club is quite difficult to manage at the moment isn't it it's really difficult it is really difficult yeah it's um like like you I wasn't I wasn't prepared for this season I didn't think this was you know I would never have predicted back in August where Arsenal would be come February it's I mean, it's great in a way, isn't it? It's what we all want and you all dream of being in a title race at this stage. It's what we were used to not so long ago and it's been a while. And But yeah, it's it's, it's tough. I mean, I remember me and you standing out in the press room, press box a couple of hours before the City game and just talking about it and the sort of size of the match and how big it felt. And it's been a long time since Arsenal been in, really been involved in anything like that, certainly when it comes to the Premier League. So... I mean, it's been a brilliant season though, isn't it? It's just been so much fun. There's been so much to like about it. There's so much to like about this Arsenal team, which we haven't really been able to save for a long time. That kind of connection with the team has been lost. I mean, I haven't enjoyed a season like this since 2007, 2008, and I really like that team. I think this mirrors it quite a lot. Um, and it's just been a lot of fun. I mean, it's going to be, <laughs> if, if they can go on and see it through now, then it's just going to be a fantastic experience to be able to sort of, be there along the way and and enjoy it all from you know I've been I've seen Arsenal win titles from the from the stands it's been brilliant you know loved it next to my dad but this will be a whole different experience and so kind of being there the whole way along the way watching it would it would be great but fortunately there's still an awful long way to go. How do you find kind of managing the whole going from fan to journalist thing? Because for me this is the first season where I've really covered Arsenal professionally uh, you know in the way that I'd hoped to for years and and I'm I'm doing it now and I'm enjoying it and I'm loving it and I'm so grateful for the opportunities I'm getting but I do mm -hmm. find myself at times kind of looking over to the north bank where my season ticket is watching them go absolutely crazy and thinking oh man I wish I had a part of that yeah yeah I, I still feel that now you know and I've been doing it for a good few years now it's, it's tough especially the big games I mean, whenever Tottenham rolls around or United or somewhere like that I sit over I mean I literally sit directly opposite where my season ticket is and I can see my dad every single game away to him before the matches and half time and there's so many times I sit thinking god I wish I was over there sat next to him in my actual seat and been able to enjoy this and having a few pints and and all that but yeah this is what I got into journalism for 20 years ago it's why I sat at parish council meetings listening to people argue about where fence posts were being put up and and stuff and back then i was sitting there thinking what am i what am i doing this for it's never it's never going to happen and but you know 20 years down the line i've managed to sort of progress through gone from being a news journalist to a sports journalist did lots of good stuff enjoyed my time covering reading moved on to arsenal and and now here i am so yeah i mean it's in a way it's tough and you do wish you do miss it. You really do miss it. But then in another on another way, it's like it's 20 years of hard work to get to this point. So you can kind of never forget that, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I I really enjoy the um, like once the game starts, I'm not too bad. I can just get into the zone of the game. It's the build up bit. It's the, you know, getting to the ground early, setting up and and not being able to travel in with your mates and, and yeah. your friends because they're obviously not going to go three hours before kickoff and all of that. Um, but yeah, obviously it's a it's a great job. It's an unbelievable job, and 
and we're not sitting here complaining about it, but it is difficult to kind of split the two, I think, sometimes when you are a fan as well uh, as a journalist covering the club. Um, what have the last couple of weeks been like for you, Charles, kind of like emotionally as a fan and as a journalist? Because I have to be honest, I didn't get to the point where I was calling for people's heads or or any of that nonsense. But I did have a little bit of a wobble in terms of my belief in this team over the last couple of weeks because it just felt like everything was going against us. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a way, but then it's only been a couple of games, isn't it? I think the fact that we got to this stage of the season, there hasn't been a wobble or a blip. It just says an awful lot about what this team's been about. I mean, they've broken every record that, I mean, they're the best Arsenal team in terms of performance of all time up to the sort of halfway stage of the season. I mean, it's out, out doing the Invincibles. That says a lot about just what they're achieving in that first half of the season. And it has been a blip. Performances have dipped a little bit. I didn't think they were bad against Manchester City. Against Brentford, you know, I know Brentford played well. I know Arsenal didn't play well, but you're going to have games like that and you just got to try and win them 1-0. And they were going to do that until they were completely robbed yeah. by a ridiculous refereeing decision. And, you know, if you're going to win titles, you need to not be at your best and win games 1-0 and grind it out. And I think back to so many of the title winning sides under Arsene Wenger and they did that in certain games, you know, when they weren't great. And then someone stepped up and did something and won a game for them. And, you know, they, that's what they've done against Brentford. They stayed in it. They rode their luck at times, but they stayed in it and they managed to get themselves in front. And they were 15 minutes away from winning that game. And you wouldn't even have talked about a blip or anything like that had that game, had they won it. Because, Basically, it would only been a one-game run without a win if they have got the got that victory against Brentford. So it's been it's been tough. There's definitely performance levels of dips and players that we've all seen be at the top of their game for the majority of the season have had a little bit of a dip in terms of their performance levels, and that start some have started to look a little bit tired. But that's just you're going to get that in seasons. It's it's just going to happen. So I wasn't overly worried about it. I always felt like this team had it in them to to come back, and I thought the performance against Manchester City certainly in the first half was a, another indicator of how how good they, this team are and how on a level playing field almost they are with Manchester City now and you know what we'll have to wait and see until the end of the season exactly how important what we saw in that second half of Villa Park is in terms of the season as a whole but it just felt very very significant coming on coming into that game on the back of the run that they were on on the back of the defeat against Manchester City with questions being asked of them for the first real time this season you know, had they not had things got not gone their way at Aston Villa, then those sort of dissenting voices would have just got louder and louder. And going behind twice, being two one down at half time, so, uh, uh, another team could have sort of waved the white flag at that point and let the season unravel. But they came out, and you know that was just more a lot more like the Arsenal that we've become accustomed to this season. The pressing was better, the energy was there, the intensity was there, all the things that were perhaps lacking a little bit. In the, in the games previously at Everton and Brentford, they came back in that second half. And Villa, like so many other teams this season, just ultimately couldn't live with Arsenal. And, you know, they got the job done. And you know, those two injury time goals, they, they just could be massive. Like I said, we'll have to wait until the end of the season to see just how big they are. But it's, they certainly felt very, very significant at the time. And then obviously what happened at Nottingham Forest just added to that significance. I wasn't at the game on on Saturday. Uh, I wasn't at Villa Park. I was was working on another game, um, but I've I've obviously watched it back multiple times now. There was a clip going round of something kicking off in the press box with a, an Aston Villa sort of representative getting a bit wound up. Was that a thing? Yeah, yeah, it all kicked off right behind us. Um, it was mad. It was just after Jorginho's goal. Basically, the Arsenal analysts. As, as you, you, you well know, in press boxes, certainly in the old grounds, a lot of the analysts sit in the press boxes because they use the laptops and, and get all the data and stuff like that. So, And that's like that at Villa Park. And they were sat behind us. And once Jorginho scored, the Arsenal lot went up and Miguel Molina, who's one of the, uh, the analysts and the, on the coaching staff under Mikel Arteta, went up and it was loud. <laughs> I could hear it. You could hear they were celebrating. Um, because it was such a massive moment and obviously the Villa coaching staff and analysts were there as well and they took exception to it and uh, one of them really kicked off at Molina and um, I kind of turned around and I saw it, I saw Molina leaving and being kind of taken out and not not dragged out by the stewards but kind of ushered out and Manas who was the uh, Aston Villa analyst was still going at him and it went on for ages and it was yeah it was something I've never seen before in my life covering any any games at any level so it was quite an experience to see it and I think it just it just kind of summed up the drama of the of the day and um you know it was a massive game 
It, it was. I think it was. It's probably the best game of the season. I think in many ways, just because of the drama. It felt like a cut game. I mean, it was a classic Unai Emery game in a way. Yeah. In that second half, there was just no midfield <laughs> whatsoever for, for Aston Villa and Arsenal were just running through them. And but you always felt on the break Villa could do something. They very nearly did. Had Aaron Ramsdale not made that save um, to deny Leon Bailey, you know, suddenly Villa are three two up there with a few minutes to go, and and the results very different. It just had that cup tie feel to it. I was sitting next to Kaya. Kainak, who obviously you know from Football London, and I said to him about 15 minutes to go, I was just like, this is not ending 2 2. It, you know, when you can just tell there's going to be another goal, but you don't know who's going to get it, what, which way is it going to go, but you just, it never felt like it was going to end 2 all. There always felt like there was going to be that sort of dramatic final moment. Unfortunately, um, it went Arsenal's way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, one of the stars of that second half was, was Jorginho. Uh, a player that obviously Arsenal bought in in the January window. I think judging by the sort of reaction to that signing online, it was a, a signing that split the fans. And the fans haven't really been split on anything up until that point this season. But what's kind of what was your opinion on Jorginho when it came out that Arsenal were closing in on a deal for him? And what is it now? Has it changed at all? Or, or were you always of the belief that he'd be a good fit? I was I was very underwhelmed. I have to say when it came when it sort of started to emerge that like it was going to happen, and then my feelings changed once I found out how much Arsenal were paying it, and more importantly how long the contract was. And then I was pretty okay with it at that point. What my big concern was suddenly it was going to be a, you know, Chelsea were going to fleece Arsenal out of about twenty odd million, and Jorginho was going to end up signing a four year contract or something like that. And you you just kind of knew how that would go at that point, and. As soon as I found out it was only an eighteen-month contract and the price, the value wasn't that high. It was like, well, to be honest, it's a smart decision. He comes in, he knows the Premier League. He's a good player. He's proven that, and he won't take any time to adjust. And he's ba- almost basically felt like a slightly long loan deal, <laughs> in a way, because you know it's not a long-term thing. It's not going to affect Arsenal's future transfer plans in terms of re-sorting out their midfield. And um, and so I was pretty okay with it. And I thought he would come in and do and do well. Obviously. It was also the fact that you kind of knew he wasn't coming in to be a, a starter. It wasn't like Arsenal signed him to improve the team. They signed him to have a replacement for Thomas Partey if needed and already has been needed. And he's come in and he's shown what he can do. I thought it was very good against Manchester City in that game, especially in the first half when Arsenal were at their best. And then he was very good against Aston Villa as well. And he deserved a one-man match, I thought. And he had that big, big moment where I think a few of the... If, whoever the sort of the last remaining naysayers over the deal were probably swung by that moment because it was such a crucial moment in Arsenal season up to this point. And you just know what you're going to get with him, don't you? He's just, he's a good player. He's an experienced player. He moves the ball well. He progresses the ball well. He's a classic Mikel Arteta midfielder. And the one worry is always his mobility and whether he's going to get found out in that regard. But I think if Arsenal play to their best strengths and they press the ball as well as they can do, then that will limit the amount of times that he might well end up getting isolated in that midfield area. So, no, I think it's a smart sign and it certainly seems to be so far because he's, he's performed well when he's been on the pitch. Well, if Arsenal do go on to win the Premier League, the £12 million fee in total or whatever it is would have been worth it alone for that goal. Yeah. Um, I know it went down as a Martinez own goal, but obviously his role in that was significant. And I just want to pick up on something you said there about sort of his ability to progress the ball. I think that surprised a lot of people because... During his time at Chelsea, he was labelled as this player that only played the ball sideways. And I know that sometimes the narratives we hear about players are not necessarily accurate, but you kind of went into it thinking, is he as progressive as we need him to be? Is he as progressive as Thomas Partey is? But when you look at the number of times in just a couple of games, even that he's been able to break the lines, it clearly shows that, you know, with the right coaching in the right team, in the right setup and under the right instructions, he can be much more impactful than anybody envisaged when we got the deal done. Yeah, and I think when you look to the numbers when he was at signing as well, you know, they stack up very, very well. He moved the ball forward more than Thomas Partey and Caicedo. You know, I did a few pieces at the time looking at the at the difference to the three players and Jorginho's stats were very, very good. And I think there's a narrative around certain players about the whole sort of passing the ball sideways. I mean, Elneny gets it as well. And actually, when you look at Elneny's stats, they don't really back up what a lot of people say, that he only part, he never passes the ball forward. It's just not true. It's just the kind of narrative that people have in their head over certain players. And I think Jorginho certainly falls under that category. And he kind of was sim- a bit similar to Granite Jacker, I think, in terms of 
divided opinion amongst the fan base. Whereas, you know, even when before this season, there was still a lot of people who really liked Granit Xhaka and then there was a lot of people who didn't like him. And I think it was very similar in terms of Chelsea's fan base with Jorginho. And, um, you know, he does, you, you look at that goal, obviously his goal, well, Martinez's his own goal, but the one that he played a big part in. When We're he giving it to him, Charles. We're giving it yeah, to him. Yeah, we'll give it to him, it, yeah. definitely. Although I did find it funny that it went in off Martinez. Um, <laughs> The uh, you actually look at that move and how it started, and it all kind of started from Jorginho dropping deep, getting the ball, and then just splitting the lines of a lovely ball through to um, I can't remember who it was now, but it might have been Odegaard, and it ended up being worked out wide. And he was really influential in the start of that move as well. And I think that's what what he's all about, and it's why Mikel just thought it was a it was a perfect signing. Obviously, he wasn't number one choice. We know that in January, but when it became clear that Brighton weren't going to do any sort of business when it came to Caicedo. It just ticks a lot of boxes, doesn't it? I think when you look when you look at it, and hopefully, come May, we'll be looking back on it, and it pre- it's proven to be an absolutely inspired piece of business. Just quickly on Caicedo, do you expect Arsenal to go back in for him come the summer? Do you think he's still at the top of the list, or do you think the circumstances might look different by sort of June, July time when we get back into the swing of transfers? It wouldn't surprise me if they go back into him because I don't think. I think they're definitely going to go. They're going to go very, very hard for Declan Rice in in the summer. But had they got Caicedo in January, I still would have expected them to go very, very hard for Declan Rice in the summer. So I don't see why that would change just because Caicedo didn't move in January. I think a lot depends on Brighton and the, their sort of valuation for him. Obviously, Arsenal and Brighton aren't exactly best of buddies at the moment. After what happened in January, Brighton weren't happy with how Arsenal sort of refused to um, sort of take no for an answer when it came for Caicedo and that ended up unsettling the player, obviously. Whether that will have an effect on any negotiations in the summer, in the summer we'll have to wait and see. But no, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's, it's difficult. We're still so far away now and things can change. But I would, if they would have got that deal over the line in January, I still fully would have expected them to go for Declan Rice in, in the summer. So it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't see why there's a reason why they can't get both this summer or go for both. I mean, get going for them and actually getting them a whole other thing. I mean, there's going to be so much, so much competition for both players. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but I think that he'll certainly still be very much higher up on their, uh, on their list of targets. If we could only get one of them in the summer, who would be your sort of preference? Cause I've, again, we keep talking about fans being split. Um, Declan Rice, Moises Caicedo, I think there's a bit of a divide in terms of what a lot of Arsenal fans would like to see come in if it is one or the other. Where would you kind of lean towards? Declan Rice for me. And I just think I think it'd be an absolutely brilliant signing for Arsenal. I think it brings so much to this team. I think it brings leadership, it brings bags, loads of quality. I think it brings loads of potential. He's only going to get better. I think his mentality is right. I honestly think it'd be the biggest signing for Arsenal since Sol Campbell, the biggest statement signing for Arsenal since Sol Campbell. Obviously, it's going to take a club record fee to do it. You're going to, and the amount of competition you have to beat off to get that deal done, I think it would say an awful lot about where Arsenal are now as a club if they could do it. And yeah, for me, I just think it'd be a wonderful signing. Thomas Partey is not getting any younger. I think for now, you could probably play. You'd probably play him in the if he did sign. You'd play him in the Shaka role. Almost have Partey still where he is, and have Declan Rice as the atta- as a slightly more attacking of the two because he can do that. We know that. He's just an all-round player. He's kind of like a Steven Gerrard almost. He's, he's a, he can do everything in that midfield. And uh, I just think he's a brilliant player. I really do. I think it'd be a fantastic signing. What's the latest on Thomas Partey? I've read some reports today that he may be back at the weekend. But, you know, I thought he'd be back maybe for Aston Villa. And obviously that wasn't the case. So do you have any update for us on the Thomas Partey situation? It's, it's They'll decide later on this. I don't think he's training yet. And I spoke to someone today and they, you know, Part he's definitely trying to be fit for the weekend, but um, you know I think that'll be a decision for for Friday. The fact he's not even training yet, you know, this you don't want to take any risk with him, do you? And I think the fact that Jorginho's there now, you don't really need to take a risk with with him. And whereas before you kind of just rush Party back just to get him in the side, now you've got Jorginho, who's clearly a very good player who can play in that role and is going to be full of confidence right now. And, there's still such a long way this season to go. There's 14 games in the league left after this Europa League starting up again. The last thing you want to do is bring Party back a bit too early and end up him suddenly aggravating it even more and being out for six weeks or something like that, which we know can happen with Thomas Party. So, no, my latest on it is just that he's not training yet. 
he's trying to get back fit. Arsenal are hopeful that he might be, but it'll be a decision for later on in the week. And if he, there's any slight doubt, then he won't be in that squad. Yeah, and I think, you know, as you mentioned, Jorginho being there obviously makes the world of difference. But with Jorginho performing as well, it it reduces the need, doesn't it, to push Thomas Partey back in. And we've seen that been done before. And, and we've seen uh, Arsenal suffer for that because injuries have popped up again. And it's such a shame because when you look at Thomas Partey's injury record prior to coming to Arsenal, it was almost flawless. And ever since he's come to the club, it feels like he's never more than a few weeks away from sort of a muscular injury. And I know he'd had a good run this season and it was pretty good, but you're always worried about that, aren't you? That's that's a big kind of drawback when it comes to Thomas Partey. It is, yeah. And it has been a bit of a shame because, like you said, the, his injury record was so good before arriving here. It just it almost feels like he's never recovered from that first one that he got at Arsenal because he was rushed back after that. And then he aggravated it again, went out again. And he's always kind of it's felt like he'd been chasing his fitness basically ever since he arrived until this season where it had been so much better he was playing constantly and so that was a shame when he when he kind of picked this one up but hopefully it's nothing too bad and and you know it's not going to be one of these sort of six weeks two month thing that it can turn into and um and he's back sooner rather than later because look when he plays he absolutely i think he's the most important player in the arsenal team i really do and maybe that's slightly lesser now by the arrival of Jorginho, especially if Jorginho can keep this time to form up but yeah, before that, he was certainly, for, for me, the most important player and the most integral player in this team. Completely agree. And and that's what makes where Arsenal are so amazing at the moment. Because if you'd have asked me at the start of the season, to, like sort of three, four weeks into the season, when we'd kind of seen the way the team had taken shape, if you'd asked me to name the two players that we could ill afford to lose, I'd have gone with Jesus and I'd have gone with Partey. And we've been without Jesus for a long, long time. Thomas Partey is now absent as well. And yet we're still in the hunt and we're still in the race, which is a testament to the rest of the group and the rest of the squad that, that Mikel Arteta has built. What's your understanding of the, the Gabriel Jesus situation? Because uh, we keep getting these little snippets on social media of him at London Colney, et cetera, et cetera. But the club have been very quiet, haven't they, on mm. timescales. They've been very reluctant to commit. How long do you think it will be? And I know it's impossible to know for sure, but what, what's your kind of instinct around how long he'll be out for? Um, and how long will it take to get him back on the pitch or at least involved in some capacity? We're getting there. We're getting there. I think it's not going to be too far away, providing he doesn't suffer any setbacks at this this point. He's back out on the pitch. Obviously, he's not he's not in full training yet. He's not, so he's not doing any contact stuff. And with these sort of injuries and these re recoveries, it's always step by step because it, you've got to try and load load the knee, really, to make sure that it can cope, cope with the added um, physicality and stresses that go with it in in being a Premier League footballer and the last thing you want to do again with Jesus especially with Jesus actually given how serious an injury this was is rushing back anytime soon because if he comes back now and aggravates it again then you're looking at him he'll be out for the season we won't see him and there's still loads of games to play so this is almost the most the most um important stage of his recovery because this is when he's not he's not really in the gym anymore he's out on the pitch and then you start when you start putting him out and in actual full training and he's taking wax on the knee and and doing all that sort of stuff then it's really a, a almost a dangerous time so they're not going to rush him he is getting there I think we're probably only a couple of weeks away I think from him suddenly seeing him in full training again or sort of edging towards full training anyway um but it's always it's always felt like a March mid-March type thing with Jesus that was the although they never put a time frame you were always kind of told it was going to be around three months and that's the that's where we're at at this stage, sort of early March type thing. And what are we now? We're at, we're not we're on February the twenty first, aren't we? So, yeah, maybe a couple more weeks, and it's just, it seems to be all on track, which is a good thing. Is it? Although, like I said, the time frame was never really given by Arsenal. It was always sort of insinuated that this was around the time it start coming back. So it appears like it's all on track, and fingers crossed at the moment there hasn't been any setbacks, which you often get in these cases. Absolutely, and and you can always kind of. You know, you can't really tell with a knee injury until, as you say, you get back into full training and you're changing direction quickly and you're going into people. And Jesus's game is is so much about that, that, you know, the quick changes of direction, the the contact and all of that stuff that you do need to be extremely careful. What have you made of Eddie and Ketia in terms of stepping up to the mark and, and filling the boots of Gabriel Jesus? He's missed a few big chances of late, but generally speaking, I think he's done quite well. 
I think he's done very well. I think he's done he's done really well. Um, he scored goals. I mean, look, he's on a he's on a difficult run at the moment, and I think I, I wouldn't really criticise him for Bre the Brentford and Everton games because he was just up against massive defenders who showed no willingness to move, and he was getting very little support, and um, no one really created anything for him. Obviously, the games against Manchester City and against Villa have been have slightly been different because he had some chances. Against City, you miss some big chances. Against Villa, you miss that one-on-one, -on -one, which he should have done better with. It's his, first, his second touch took him too far away. And that I think that's where the chance has gone. It wasn't really the finish, because I think he just made the finish so difficult for himself by that touch. But I thought he actually played well at Villa uh, uh, in terms of his all-round game. And, um, you know, he did really well to win the, you know, kind of rob the ball off the defender and set up the chance for Odegaard that Odegaard missed. And, um, so I think he's done well. I think he stepped up to the plate. He's all, look, he's not as good as Gabriel Jesus. <laughs> that's not. It's just the. It's just a given, and it's not. That's not Eddie's fault. He's still a very, very good player. He's doing good things for Arsenal, and his goal record speaks for itself. Really, he's just having a bit of a difficult time the last couple of weeks. But on the whole, he stepped up. You know, when when Jesus got injured, I mean, we all must have sat there and thought, "Oh my God, what what is what is going to happen here? This is the end of the title charge," and it hasn't been because Eddie stepped up and he's done the job a lot better than probably many of us thought he would do. And I think he deserves an awful lot of credit for that. Some of the some of the grief he gets, and I know you've got to kind of separate social media from almost real life because social media is just this fantasy world a lot of time where people are just given free license to say what they want and often they don't even mean it. And I'll no, say it, it's, it's a shithole. Twitter is a yeah, shithole. Like, it, it, it is, yeah. <laughs> and so you've got to kind of, distance yourself from that when and I think in our jobs because we have to be around Twitter so much that sometimes you can it can cloud your judgment and you actually think that's what a, people really think or a lot of people really think and it's just not the case and I think deep that I think I mean listen to the away fans at the Villa Park on Saturday they're all chanting in his name the whole way through that second half after you miss after you miss that chance they're all chanting his name and um you know that's that's what it's all about, really. And I think I think most Arsenal fans know that he's stepped up and done a very good job in Jesus' absence. Yeah, you make a great point. And, and that's where I think your experience as a journalist comes in as well, where you you can block out that noise that you probably see online and and sort of focus on, you know, what, what you're actually seeing in the ground and and the feeling you're getting there. I'm I'm someone that still probably needs to do a bit more work on that, like in terms of not reacting to a silly tweet that I read. Um, and and sort of biting back at it from you know just frustration because yeah a lot of the time it doesn't represent the match going fan especially and a lot of the fans across the world that you know dedicate their time and money and effort to kind of uh, follow the club and support the club. Mm. Um, Mohamed El Neni, it's broken today is or it's been announced today has been given a new contract, um, an extension uh, for a further year. It felt like something Arsenal were going to do because of his you know, maybe because of his loyalty to the club, because of how much they love him. Some people are suggesting that this was done because he was injured. But if I'm not mistaken, there were whispers of this even before we knew that the injury um, was as serious as it is. Is that right to your knowledge? Yeah, I think they were going to take up the option anyway. Um, this isn't actually the option. This is a new contract. So I think it's, slight, it's slightly changed, probably because of the injury, because they'll know from... Um, our understanding, Mark and Brian's PA tweeted this earlier that it, it, he understands that um, it's a reduced wages on this deal. So I kind of presume that had the injury not happened, he would have just had the contract extended and been on the same wages he was on. But now, because of the injury, they've given him a new contract, but on less money, if you see what I mean. So, yeah. um, which makes sense to me. And I think it's a really good move from Arsenal. Everyone loves El Nani, he's such a popular figure. He's got this horrible injury. Had he left at the end of the season he would have still had lots and lots of time to go on in terms of his recovery and re rehabilitation and be basically thrown out on his own at this point to kind of see that recovery through and you know no one at Arsenal would want him to do that he's, so, he's, he's someone who's so popular there he's the longest serving player at the club and I think they've done the absolutely the right thing here they've given him time they've given him security just so where he can just have that security in the background and safe in the knowledge that he can do his recovery while still having a contract. And, you know, Arsene Wenger did the same thing with Santi Cazorla in Cazorla's last year when he was enduring those horrible injuries and the recovery he had to go through. And um, I think I think it's a really good move from uh, from Arteta, from Edu, from the club, and um, kind of says a lot about how they operate and how they view view the sort of loyalty that El Nenny's given them as well. 
Absolutely. Um, just finally, Charles, I wanted to pick your brains a little bit on Mikel Arteta. Um, we all know that he's done a fantastic job and we've all watched the evolution of this team uh, sort of in front of our own eyes. We're all enjoying it week in, week out. The football's exhilarating uh, at times. You know, the, the passion is there. It, it's it's just a wonderful kind of mixture of, of so many factors that maybe we felt as Arsenal fans were missing for years and years and years. But Mikel Arteta is facing quite a bit of criticism in the media at the moment with regards to the way he conducts himself on the touchline. I mean, it, it kind of feels like Arsenal are back again just because people are looking for anything and everything to have a go at us about. Um, I don't think that Mikel's overstepped any lines. How do you kind of see it? Because obviously you see him week in, week out. You're in the press conferences where he can be a little bit, how do I want to put it? Um can be a little bit short with some of his answers. I mean, I've asked him questions and he's always given an answer, but you get the feeling sometimes that he doesn't want to really entertain some of it. What's your kind of thoughts on Mikel Arteta as someone who covers the club? <laughs> he's he, just, he's yeah, very well. much in the mould of Pep Guardiola. <laughs> he just very much is. You can tell he's a student of Pep. And he's if you're wanting someone to really open up in terms of to the media in terms of the cameras he's just not the person to do that and if he wants to talk about a subject he will talk about it but if he doesn't then he absolutely will not and you will not get anything out of him it's plain and simple it's not like an Arsene Wenger where you could sit down you could ask him a question and then just sit back for four minutes and listen to this <laughs> amazing answer about so many different things and he's just never going to be that sort of person and I think in a way that's what makes him so impressive as a young manager because he knows exactly what he wants he's not going to take any bullshit from anyone he's just gonna if he doesn't want to talk to you if he doesn't want to answer that question he's not going to answer it and he's perfectly within his rights to do that and in terms of his touchline behavior i think it's very much a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon and trying to shout loud on social media i don't think it's anything that arsenal are bothered about um maybe he does cross the line every now and again and i think he kind of admits that himself uh, sometimes he needs to look at himself in the mirror and on occasion, if he feels like he's crossed the line, then he'll, he'll accept that. But I don't, I don't really think there's too many um, situations this season where I can immediately think that he's done that. I think he's always just about stayed on the right line of passionate. And, you know, as a fan, you kind of want to see that from your manager, don't you? Absolutely, I think you, 100%. Kind of look at, yeah. You look at Chelsea fans at the moment and what they're thinking of Potter, and I think Potter's a fantastic manager and really impressive guy. But... I have to admit, since he's been to Chelsea, which is a whole other level from a Brighton type club, that at times you want your manager to be nasty. You want him to use the size of the club as an influence when you're standing in front of the cameras to put influence on referees, to put influence on other pe other people, to try and put influence on players. And when you're not really using that to your advantage in the media, it can make you look a little bit weak, I think. And Arteta does that very well. Maybe that's something Potter needs to learn from at Chelsea. So... Look, I think he's just a fantastic manager. What he's doing this season is incredible. And you always knew it as well. Even in those dark times early on under Arteta, you, it, it was weird. Like when you were there, when I was there during the Emery time, and Emery's a clearly a fantastic manager. I mean, look what he's achieved in the game has been brilliant. But you could just tell when you were there, when you were listening to him, when you were around the club, when you were watching training sessions, you could just tell it wasn't there. It was missing. The spark wasn't there and it wasn't going to work and it needed to change. It was so glaringly obvious, especially in that second season after the Europa League final defeat. Mm -hmm. And it, But when you were there for Arteta, even when the results weren't going the way and he could have easily been sacked because of how bad results were early on, you never had that feeling of he's out of his depth here, it's not working. You always thought, well, I always thought from speaking to people, from watching and taking it all in, that he was going to turn things around and that Arsenal were going to be on the way to something pretty special under him. So it's no real surprise to me that it's happened. It's definitely a surprise it's happened this quickly in terms of challenging a team like Manchester City. But yeah, I think Arsenal are very lucky to have him. It's just a kind of shame when you look at it. Although so I was going to say it's a shame they didn't just do it first time round and sort of cut out the whole Emery. 18 month era but then you almost feel like you needed that barrier from Wenger you almost needed yeah. that other other manager there rather than it being straight to Mikel from from Arsenal maybe that would have been a little bit of a bridge too far for such an inexperienced manager and you needed that that guy to be the kind of um the point in the middle who bored all the criticism and stuff like that that Emery ended up being but yeah and no, I think Arsenal are very lucky to have Mikel Arteta definitely
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, looking forward to seeing uh, where he takes this team and how it develops. And fingers crossed, uh, this could turn out to be a very, very special season. Um, Charles, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your busy day to join me. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, let people know where they can find your work. It'll all be linked uh, below, but for the benefit of our audio listeners, where can they find you? How can they find your YouTube channel and tell them what you're up to? Uh, well, you find me on Twitter, Charles underscore Watts. Just type in Charles Watts, Arsenal News and Press Box on YouTube. I'm on Facebook as well. And obviously all my stuff is on goal.com. So just click on the Arsenal tab or it'll be all over the homepage as well. Brilliant stuff. Make sure you give Charles a follow. Make sure you subscribe to him across all the different platforms. Thank you for tuning in uh, to the show. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review. We'll be back very, very soon with more. Until next time, goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.